Previously on the Tony Kornheiser Show. Read this out loud. Salted egg fish skins. I believe it's described as crunchy. Crunchy, crispy, addictive from the snack yard. Salted egg fish skins. No, thank Are we you. eating these, Michael? I don't. I mean, it just doesn't sound appealing. Crack one open. No, it, in the break. I'll do it in the break. It just. It, did we get Nigel, would you eat something called a salted egg fish skin? I don't no. know. No, Michael, what's it made me... out of? Is it made out of fish? I'm hoping it's made out of fish skin. I don't know. <laughs> this is General George Washington, and you're listening to the Tony Kornheiser Show. We each ate two or three of them, and then we tossed them, right? We did you go back into the trash can for no, more? No, I did not. I just tossed them. I tossed did mom? Them. I don't know. She may have. She, you know, she may be in there still, for all I know. Um, Michael is six feet one inches away from me at the other end of Uncle Benny's table. We are doing a podcast. I write down notes the night before of things I might want to open with now that the new way we do the show is Michael and I talk for a while and then we bring in guests. I wrote down how um, Bryson DeChambeau has said publicly he's going to attack Augusta essentially with a fury unknown to mankind, and he's going to hit driver 360 and 370. Watch out, number 13. And he's just going to bomb through Augusta. I thought I could talk about that. I got a story about a guy in a gym uh, at Columbia where I had to leave the gym because he was grunting and sweating and lifting weights and much too close to me. I got the Nuggets beating the Lakers last night, surprising to me. I sit on television. I get it wrong every single day. I got Billy Donovan going to the Bulls. Billy Donovan, Long Island boy. Pretty good coach, and I could talk about that. I got a story about uh, my dog, Chessie, uh, killing a rabbit a week ago that I've never told. And I got all those. But I'm going to talk about, and this is uh, an exercise in futility for me and for everybody who's listening, the Washington Nationals. I know I've said I'm done with them. I know I've said they keep dragging me back. I mean, they're, you know, their games start at a very opportune time for me, 6 o'clock. I mean, I've, you know... I'm done with PTI. I can watch a little bit. And, and I get pulled down into the vortex of the Washington Nationals. And this happened to me yesterday. As I didn't even know there was a game one. I got to it late with the game one. And game two was starting. I found out they won game one. I didn't know that Austin Voth had pitched a complete game. It's only seven innings in, a, in these new doubleheaders, which are fun seven-inning doubleheaders. He was surprised. I didn't know it. I, I had no idea. He's a terrible pitcher. His ERA, even with a complete game, is like 6-9-0 or something like that. It's really Trending, bad. Trending, though. It's really bad. So I didn't even know. So I settled in to watch a little bit of the second game, and when I tuned in, the Nats were already down 2 nothing. They were down to Philadelphia 2 nothing. And what I'm saying to you is I'm a fan. I mean... It doesn't matter if I say I'm done. I'm not really done. I'm done for the moment, but I'm a fan. Those of you out there who are listening who are fans of a given sport or a given team, you know what this is like. You, you, it's inescapable. If it were done, when it were done, then twere well, it were done quickly. Right. And, you know, and it's not done quickly. It, it, it just oh, seven lingers. Seven games are. Well, those are done quickly, but there's two of them, so it's 14 innings. And last night, there were 15 innings. And I just want to tell you what happened. And if you don't believe me, you can go find Chuck Todd and ask Chuck Todd the kinds of things I was writing to him last night on the subject of Wander Suero, oh. the worst, the worst pitcher maybe in the history of pitching. He is terrible. I don't understand why he's on the team. I don't understand why Davey Martinez goes with him. And more importantly, I don't understand why he stays with him. I don't understand it. The Nats were down 2 nothing, and then they were up 4-2. And then it was 4-3, and then it was 6-3, pretty late in the 5th or the 6th or something like that. 6-3. And they bring in Wander Suero, and the first thing he does is give up a two-run double. That's the first thing he does to Didi Gregorius. But it was someone else's run. Yeah, but he, it was one pitch, two-run double. And now it's 6-5. And he gets out of that inning, and the next inning he can't get out of. He can't. He hits a batter, and he walks two batters. His bases are loaded, and you bring in this poor guy Finnegan. You give him bases loaded. That's Great like hair. It's not fair to give a guy bases loaded like that. And Finnegan induces what appears to be a possible ground out. Um, it's, it's an infield ground ball. It's not ball. just bases loaded. Who's at the plate? Who's at the plate with that? That's Harper. No, it's real. Uh, oh, a real Muto. Muto. Real Muto's at the plate. So... 
so he induces a ground ball, and the way they are shifted, Trey Turner goes to his left, pretty much behind second base or almost to second base, grabs the ball, throws it. It's not a good throw. It isn't. It's not a good throw. And once again, Eric Thames can't make a good play. You know, he can. He jumps off the base. It's a lot of body to move. Uh, I understand. He, he's, he's useless. Eric Thames is a useless addition, just totally useless. The other night he dropped a throw from Keyboom, and Keyboom somehow got the error at first. And last night he jumped off the base, and the runner's safe. You know, you watch the first replay, and you go, huh? okay, so now it's 6-6. Suero has ruined my life, ruined the game, and now it's 6-6. And now we go ultimately to the top of the eighth inning. And, and if you don't remember how this works, you start with a runner on second, and the runner is a slow runner. It's the guy who came in for Real Muto. It, he, he ended up at first base. He's slow. He's on first, and Gregorius is going to bunt him. To, he's on second, rather, and gr that's the rule. You start with a runner on second, the runner who was either like the last the final out, out in the previous inning. Yeah, so this guy is... But, but I thought Neil Greenberg said you shouldn't bunt in that situation. Well, this guy is going to bunt. Gregorius is going to bunt, and once again... F.P. Santangelos talks about how uncomfortable Gregorius is bunting. He did this a week ago. He was dead solid wrong because Gregorio, Gregorius then delivered a beautiful bunt. And it, the exact same thing happened. F.P., shut up about bunting, of which you know nothing. <laughs> you know nothing about Didi Gregorius' ability to bunt because we've now seen him lay down two perfect bunts. He lays down a perfect bunt to third base. The third baseman... Brock Holt. Brock Star. Yeah. He has to come in. The guy's going to be safe at third, but he's going to be more than safe at third because Brock Holt throws it into the right field stands. Like Eric Thames would have to be 12 feet tall to jump up and knock this down. So now it is seven to six. And at that moment, I turn off the television. I'm disgusted. I am disgusted. Michael, why don't you pick it up from there? Well, I think we should fast forward a little bit, right? Yeah. Well, let, let's just speed this along to they get out of the top of the inning, they only giving up one. That's so right. they sit there going, okay, the first batter in the bottom of, the, of that half inning is going to be a very important at-bat just to try and get that run back. Who was the first at-bat in there? Was it Thames striking uh, out? I, I, was, I left. I didn't, I didn't watch. Okay. I didn't watch. Well, the, the, the did Thames strike out? He's the, terrible. The long and short of this is the, the game ends up being saved by a 32-year-old yeah. rookie. Well, he's not even – yeah, he's been in the minors for a 1,000 years. He's never had a major league home run. Everything he does is the first time he does it. Yeah, Yadiel uh, Hernandez. Yadiel Hernandez, Hernandez gets Hernandez. a pitch inside, just completely turns, turns. on it. It's a no-doubter. Harper doesn't yes. even look at it as right. it goes into the, into the right field bleachers. Uh, and then that's win, and I'm not watching. I'm, not I, I'm embarrassed to admit how happy this win and particularly this two-game sweep made me feel. Well, it's four in a row now. It's four in a row. The and who have they beaten? Who is the one team, the Washington Nationals, in a lost season? And it, it's totally lost. They're not prepared for this season. Their pitching gave out. Rizzo didn't put the right people out there. The acquisitions of Thames didn't work. The acquisition of Starling Castro would have worked, but he got hurt. You know, it, it's totally lost. Who's the one team you want to beat and why? Phillies. Yes. And it has everything to do with old number 34. <laughs> Price hard. Number three, who went 0 for 13 through these three games with six Ks. <laughs> That's right. So if you and can knock them out, right out field. if you can knock the Phillies out of the playoffs, even if you don't make it, that's wonderful. And this That's game glorious. One, game one of yesterday's doubleheader was against Nola, who they're hoping that through this series, they would give him enough off days so that he could start game one of, of the, the three-game wildcard series. And now it looks like he'll have to pitch the last game of the season if they're still in, in playoff contention, which they, they probably will be against Tampa. Let me say a couple of things about the Phillies growing up as essentially a Mets fan. I, I don't hate the Phillies. And Michael, you went to school in Philadelphia and I am inclined towards. Many I would really like to teams. root for Philly. I mean, they're yeah. a fun team to root. They have great hats. The P is so well constructed, and on top of the red hat is a blue little thing, a blue knob of some sort, and it's really distinctive. And they've had these hats for a long time. Their uniforms are great. They've had essentially the same uniform for eighty Do you years. Like the all blues? No, I don't like the all blues. That was the Mike Schmidt era. I don't like those. I like the whites. 
with the Phillies in a little bit of script and the blue dots on top of the eyes. I just really like the Phillies uniforms. They fired Gabe Kapler last year because he didn't make the playoffs. They hired Joe Girardi. Everybody would say that's an upgrade. What happens if Girardi doesn't make the playoffs? Well, it gets with even, a really good it gets even lineup. Better, One San, through nine is really good. San Francisco's at I think five hundred right now, so they're still and mathematically managing them. ahead of them. I don't know who their last series is against, but you look at Tampa. I I'm not sure what motivation they might have, but that's a harder path to try and get there, particularly with what's going on in the Central with Milwaukee and Cincinnati. One of those two teams will get one of the wild card spots. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I've, I know I've wasted the entire open and I should have done other things, but I, the fact that I was so angry last night and then I turned off the television and awoke, awakened this morning to find out they had won, that this kid had hit it out in what is, in my mind, the bottom of the 10th, but it's actually the bottom of the 8th. And, it's um, baseball. Yeah, it's it's and it's going to be over this week. For game one, home I, team. I took the hammer on a, on a nap walk, and I watched the entire end of game one on my cell phone as the battery drained down to two percent. Is that right? Never felt more uncomfortable. Yeah. So, um, so congratulations to the Nats. They are apparently not mathematically eliminated, but they're not. FP kept saying that last just, night. And another thing, well, I I don't want to knock the announcers, but but seriously, I assume that. I'm going to assume that FP stands for Francis Paul. I've always figured that in my mind. Maybe it doesn't. But I wanted to say to him, stop with your analysis of Didi Gregorius. Stop. You're wrong. You've been wrong, loud wrong twice now. Stop. The guy knows how to bunt. You can't really be a leadoff batter in, in the National League or the American. Well, now you can with, with DHs. You can't really be a leadoff batter and not know how to bunt. you got to know how to bunt. Right? Yeah. You got to. That's one of the rules. So shut up with this. By the way, okay. I'm looking at uh, FP's Wikipedia page. Yeah. Uh, FP stands for Feliciano Prego. Oh, no, I'm, really? I'm kidding. It, no, you were right. It's Frank Paul, not Francis, but. Oh, it's we not. Fr Frank. Well, you sure it's not Francis? It you, says you sure Frank. It's Frank. It says Frank. Well, so. I'm okay. But as, as right. we know, in the greatest television show ever, Hill Street Blues. It was Francis Ferrillo, <laughs> and everybody Ferrillo. called him Frank. It was Francis Xavier Ferrillo, I believe. I could be wrong on that. Was it Francis Carl Ferrillo? Wasn't that it? I don't think it was Carl Ferrillo, no. No, no. But I remember when the, they used to get the gang members in there and go, Furillo. It was such a, it's the best. Because you couldn't curse. It's the best show of all time. Hill Street Blues. The best. Okay. Yes. Um, How about that? F Francis Xavier Frank Ferrillo. Cap, that's... what. I'm no, sorry, did not. I not did did you hear that within the last thirty seconds? I did, yes. but I was just verifying and it you you're absolutely yes. right. Yes. So I'm not sure that FP Santangelo, I'm not sure that that is not Francis. I mean I know it says Frank, but I'm not you know, I know, not sure. Uh we'll take a break. Jason Lock and four of CBS Sports will join us when we return. I am Tony Kornheiser. You're listening, you're listening to the Tony Kornheiser show. This is the uh, Lincoln Financial. Uh, read and I think it's pretty well done. The the problem is, you know, you have to update the football stat on it, but I think they have. Hey, everyone, this new world we're living in has me and my family talking a lot more. I mean, we're talking about everything from how much greater was the greatest of all time than today's greatest to how to make sourdough bread. Again, my daughter Elizabeth has made, can made, and will make again sourdough bread from scratch. To how excited we are that football is finally back. Okay, so they they updated that. And trust me, that last one's important. I can't keep watching my dog run circles in the backyard and call that a spectator sport. Actually, it is. And then she brings the Frisbees over to me, and she wants me to rip them out of her mouth. And today, one Frisbee, what happened to the gray Frisbee that we oh, ripped out of her we mouth? We need a replacement Frisbee. Yeah, because it, it broke in half. It went in half. Mm. You know, you can't take something out of a dog's mouth. Oh, and here dogs. she is. But despite how talkative we all are, the people at Lincoln Financial want to point out the one conversation that most people still haven't had, your financial plans. So do find time to talk to your loved ones about it. Because the more we talk, the better we plan, protect, and retire. And that is why Lincoln Financial is here to help you. This is a good ad. You should go to it. Get the right questions to start your conversation at LincolnFinancial.com. You're listening to The Tony Kornheiser Show. <laughs> yeah. Hey, she ain't no arrest that I'm nervous, but I'm right now. This is a song called Right Now. And though you think 
that's a man doing the song. When I started to read the first sentence, I was convinced it was a woman before I heard the song. Because here's the sentence, Dear Uncle Tony, my name is Rose, also known as Uncut Rose, and I am from Houston, Texas. The title of the song included is Right Now, released in July as part of my EP, Something Light, streaming on all major platforms, and hopefully gets a play on the show. Sending the clean version for sensitive ears. P.S. Loved you since 2005, the first time I saw PTI at the naive age of 14. So I would have said this was a woman, but it's a man. And this is pretty good. This yeah. is not my style of music, but his voice is very good. And yeah. there is a tremendous melodic quality to this. Am I wrong on this one? Hypnotic. It's really good. Right now. By Uncut Rose. Playing in Jason LaConfora of Radio Fame and CBS Sports. And this is our first week of talking about football games that have actually been played uh, with, with legitimate questions because after two games, you you know, you still don't know, but yeah. you have a better sense after two. So let me get to the top of mind question based on Monday night, and that is, are you worried and should we be worried about 41-year-old yeah. Drew Brees? I am, Tom. I am. Uh, I try not to be, you know, a hot take jockey. But yeah. <laughs> I found myself watching that game and several occasions thinking, I think Jameis pushes the ball downfield there. I think Jameis completes that pass. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think they could play at a different pace and do some different things. If they had a younger guy in there um, and somebody who saw the field a little differently. I, we've seen Drew Brees limp into two successive postseasons. Drew Brees himself if you listen to him after that you know, loss to the Vikings, in, in which he did not function very well against the defense, that was fairly suspect for the better part of the year. I came away from that thinking, this is, this is the end. And then he has another press conference and says, Give me a, I'm going to take a month to think about this. And then he takes damn near that full month before he comes back and says, yeah, I'm going to keep doing this. I, I think you, you look at the totality of that, the the, the the body part of it. And remember last year, he got like a six week reprieve. It wasn't that same grind because he missed six weeks with the thumb. That's right. Still, Bridgewater was in there. That's by right. January, he looked like he's treading water and, and almost going under. So I look at the, the mental, I look at the verbal sort of what he's said and the signals he sent that way. And I look at him in September looking like he did in January. And I think it's a thing. Um, I just do, uh, his stature for the first time for me watching him play looks like an issue. Like you just wonder what did he see there or what didn't he see? And, and we're probably being too nitpicky because he's an all-time great and he's one of the most accurate quarterbacks of all time. But I think that's his last two years, he completed 74% yeah. of his passes. He's down to 64. A lot of guys in the league would love to be up sure. to 64. But and you see something. Missing, Tony. It's not like, okay, well, his arm isn't the same but they're still flinging it downfield, knowing that some of that stuff won't be completed, but it's just a decoy. It's a sell job. It's to force you to defend them differently. They don't even take right. those fake shots. They don't even fake it. I mean, it's all short and underneath. Yes. It's become very easy to defend, and then you take a Michael Thomas out of it, uh, the equation is yes. even tougher. Saying all that, I think if, if Kamara touches the ball eight to ten more times in that game, they probably win it because they, they really didn't have an answer for him. And I thought defense – and run game, they still beat a Raiders team that's not very good on defense. I mean, that's the other thing, too. I mean, the Raiders go and get Kwiatkowski to be, you know, lead their linebacking core and be their coverage linebacker. He didn't even play in the game. Like, uh, that same defense got absolutely methodically moved up and down the field, you know, six days prior by the Carolina Panthers. So, I, I have some questions, and I'm, I, don't, I know that they think Taysom Hill might be the answer. I'm less than sold on that. I, I, if I'm in that building right now and I'm seeing what I'm seeing, I'm thinking by October do we want to run some completely different offense for Taysom Hill and try that thing? Or if this keeps up, do we turn it over to Jameis? Jameis Winston, he of the 30-30 club, the only one ever. Okay, we'll move on to something else. The NFL is clearly serious about coaches and masks. Yes, sir. They have now fined five coaches $100,000 each, and yes. I believe five teams $250,000 yes. each. What do you think of this? Well, 
I, I don't think anyone should be surprised by it. It's something we talked about on the NFL today, and, and, and I talked to Troy Vincent after he sent the memo out to all these teams, putting them on notice, and he made it clear to me, like, this isn't uh, three strikes and you're out. This isn't like a probationary period. Like, you've all been warned. We agreed to these protocols. We spent hundreds, probably thousands of hours dating back to March, talking to medical personnel, talking to lawyers, talking to doctors, talk, negotiating with the NFLPA. We put together uh, a, 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 a set of protocols and regulations that have worked astonishingly well, beyond anybody's wildest dreams. Oh, my alone, God, yes. expectations. Another Tremendous. week with zero cases. And you know what? Part of what we signed up for and part of what the guys who signed your paycheck signed up for was to try to regulate these sidelines as best we can, even if you think it's just for optics, even if you think it's just for PR. People all over this world are wearing masks to work. It is a new part of your sort of occupational mindset. Deal with it. We don't want you running around yelling all over the place on international TV. These games are shown everywhere. You know, with, with some people wearing masks and some not, the head coach is prominent. The head coach is the leader of the organization. The head coach in many places is the face of the franchise. For three hours on Sunday, wear the damn mask as much as possible. So I, I don't think the pendulum swing in the other way, Tony. I, I just No, I, I agree. I'm no wondering. No hurt by wearing a mask, you know? So, and, and some of these guys are older. And some of these guys, you know, BDs or a history of, of – um, respiratory issues that make them more vulnerable to it. Uh, everything has worked to this point, and there's a lot of frustration in Park Avenue um, about if all these players are doing their part, right, and, and everybody is buying in mind, body, and soul, why can't it look that way too when we're actually playing the games with the guys on the sidelines? I've got to think, Jason, that, that this $100,000, that's just this week. Yeah. If it happens next week, I think it at least doubles. I do. I, yeah, I have not had that conversation with people. It is something I am efforting this week. If if this works in any way like the fine schedule would work for players, you know, even with things as simple as uh, the uniform regulations. Like I remember when I covered the Washington football team, you know, and Clinton Portis, you know, wanted to put – and Sean Shoes Taylor wanted and to stuff. put tape on their helmets or they wanted to wear oh, yeah. different socks. Like it ratcheted up each week. I can't imagine with something of this magnitude, with the fines already being as high as they are, that it wouldn't quickly jump to another gear. I think the real question is, I think. how much more do you go financially, and at what point do you say, okay, these guys Suspension. are all competitive Suspension. to a fault, they're all maniacal in how sort of paranoid they are, let's hit them where it hurts, let's hit them with a 15-yard flag. Like, oh, okay. I think you'd see it end immediately. Yeah. Um, they'd be all be talk. wearing, you know, they'd, they'd be dressed up like mummies. They would be mummified. You wouldn't be able to see anything about them. Uh, they would do anything possible not to get repeated 15-yard penalties for, you know, mm -hmm. illegal use of the mask or whatever. Yeah, that would be a great penalty, illegal use of the mask. I like that. <laughs> um, there are a lot of 0-2 teams, most of which are terrible, and they're not going to make yeah. the playoffs no matter what. There's one 0-2 team, though, that is intriguing most of all, and that is Houston because their draw – with the Chiefs and the Ravens in their first two games, which may very well be the best two teams in the AFC. Mm -hmm. um, is Houston one of those teams that you think rebounds, or is this, are these no. losses devastating? Yeah, I don't think Houston can run with the big boys. I, I never have. Even in the years they've run away with their division, I've looked at the composition of their team and said, I don't see them beating multiple good teams in January. I just don't think that's who they are. Um, and I didn't, I didn't fancy them to make the playoffs before the season started. Uh, the schedule will get easier, sure, but doesn't this week. It's Pittsburgh this week. Um, and Pittsburgh beat the Broncos, but don't feel very good about it. They don't believe they played anything close to their – they don't even feel like they played a B game, let alone an A game, on either side of the ball. Uh, I, I think they're going to take some of that out on the Houston Texans. Houston – I mean, I've, I've watched both their games repeatedly, you know, I watched them live and then rewatched them on film. I, they don't have an offensive identity. They don't really trust their offensive line, especially the right side of the offensive line. There's no conviction in the run game. Uh, and without Hopkins, I mean, Will Fuller, you don't even notice him. Like, you go series without even noticing him. Um, they're trying to feature Brandon Cooks. It's not going so well. 
Uh, it's dink and dunk to the tight ends. It, it, there, there's no um, tempo. Uh, there's no rhythm or cadence to how the game's being called. They got issues. And, and defensively, um, the secondary is a problem. So I don't, I don't, I don't really fancy them, Tone. Okay. Um, I All think right. this week will be tough for them. Um, and I think they'll struggle with, like, I think Jacksonville will give them games. You know, I think the Colts uh, will give them games. I think the Titans will smash them in the mouth. I think the Titans is a bad matchup for them. Um, you can run it on them, and you can throw it on them, and they really can't do either on the other side of the ball. That's not good. If I were to pose um, a question at the beginning of the football season and I were to represent – the general public at large, the question would be, the number one question would be, how's Tom Brady going to do at Tampa Bay? Well, let me take the other side of that. Tom Brady's replacement, Cam Newton at New England. I understand that going left um, on the last play of the game, he got trapped behind the line of scrimmage. But I'm wondering, they, they won one game, they were tremendously competitive, 3,000 miles away from home in the second game. What is the early word on Cam Newton with the Patriots? Um, it, it's in that building. This is what was expected. Uh, I talked to people there, you know, late in sort of uh, summer camp or whatever we're going to call it, the, the different truncated camp, and they would have been shocked by anything other than him being comeback player of the year. And I picked him as my oh. comeback player in the of the year in part in the preseason because of of what I was hearing from that building. That these are coaches who are willing to do whatever it takes to meet the skill set of their players, to reinvent themselves from play to play, quarter to quarter, game to game, month to month. Um, so the idea that somehow Cam wasn't a fit never made any sense to me. To me, he's the ultimate fit. Josh McDaniels drafted Tim Tebow in the first round in Denver and created and concocted this whole you know hybrid offense for him that, well, say what you want about it, they won a playoff game, right? They, they beat Pittsburgh. They did. Um, Tim Tebow didn't belong in the league. Cam Newton's an MVP. Um, so, you know, it's going to work. It's going to work real well. It's doing everything that I think a lot of football people thought it would do. It's unlocked the run game um, really in a way we haven't seen for years. Uh, Cam's presence and the way he forces you to defend the run game, it just naturally creates openings for other people. Sonny Michelle looks like a rookie again. Um, you know, he and Edelman are clicking. The short, intermediate stuff is, is there. They're not going to beat you a whole bunch with the deep ball. Not, he can throw it. There's not really anybody to throw they it to. They don't catch it. Yeah, they can't they get free. They a speed yeah. guy, a legitimate speed threat between now and the trade deadline. Trust me, they'll have seven-step drops for Cam to go and cut loose. Uh, he's going to run ten times a week. Like most weeks in a competitive game, he's going to get double-digit carries. Uh, and he's going to see a whole lot of the end zone one way or the other, uh, and they're also able to play a time of possession game now that helps out a defense that, let's face it, is, is not overwhelming you with star power. They've had to completely reinvent who they are on the edge and, and the linebacking core, you know, pretty much in one offseason. I mean, everybody, you know, you go back to the year before, I mean, Trey Flowers was their best pass rusher, right? He's in Detroit now making a lot of money not winning games. You know, Kyle Van Noy's going, Jamie Collins is going. They had guys opt out. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot to do more with less on that side of the ball, other than the secondary. Secondary is great. Front seven, um, when they play physical teams, could have some issues. So how do you, how do you help them out? Well, we'll hold on to the ball for 38 minutes. We'll road grade you with two tight ends and a quarterback who's built like a tight end. Um, and, and we'll force you to pick your poison with how many people you put in the box. Very good. Very good analysis. Makes me happy. Um, Wilbon and I get stuck with this question all the time because – our show has no depth whatsoever, and it's just what it is, which is which coach is on the hottest seat. And the names that are often given are Patricia yeah. and Gaze, and I add Quinn and Fangio oh, yeah. to that. Yeah. Um, I might even add Bill O'Brien to that by the middle of the year. Mm -hmm. But of those, of those four that I'm, that I'm concentrating on, are any of them really in, in jeopardy now? Um, yeah, I mean, look, a couple of those situations could come to a head in season. I don't think many will, and I think the overall sort of overriding trend when we get to January will be we had a pandemic. We didn't make the money we thought we were going to make. We weren't able to prepare the way we were, you know, we wanted to. 
I think some guys will get mulligans because, A, owners aren't going to want to jump on their plane and fly all over the place to do coaching interviews. B, they already aren't going to meet their revenue goals, so I'm not going to fire a guy who's not going to be rehired as a head coach anywhere to offset the money and pay people $5, $10, 15000000 million to go away. We're just not in that mode as an ownership group right now. Um, you know, so I think we'll see less sort of uh, churn than normal. But, um, you know, coming into the year, if you would have said, who are the four guys I think are, you know, it could face some potential of meeting their fate in season, I would have said Quinn, I would have said Gase, uh, I would have said Patricia, and I would have said Doug Marone. Uh, now, what's going on in Jacksonville? Gardner Minshew, he, he might he might be saving jobs. Um, he also might keep them from getting Trevor Lawrence. But uh, he 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 alone and what he's able to do uh, with that offense, it, it's already for two weeks. It, it's already shown he can keep them competitive. Um, and they're trying to figure some things out on the other side of the ball. But those other guys, um, it, it really couldn't have gone worse for those other three. And I think Fangio, I don't think always fires Fangio in season, but I also have a hard time thinking that if, if the, unfortunately with the injuries they've had there yeah, and his inability they to can't. build that monster of a defense they expected, I just don't see how it, it ends well there. And I see the pendulum going the other way and them getting an offensive minded guy to try to, you know, unlock Drew Locke um, next year. And we already know Locke's, you know, first half of his season's, going to be a wash this year due to injury no i think you've hit on the key guys o'brien has that owner bamboozled now um but i i, I you, you i think i laid out my reservations with the houston football yes, you team did. Yeah. and if it goes as i think it will go given all the power that he wields and given um the the number of toxic relationships he's had with people in that building going back years I'm not sure he's going to be able to survive, uh, you know, a below 500 season, and I think that team will finish below 500. Please plug your radio show and tell people how exciting it's going to be this week in Baltimore because of Baltimore, yeah. Kansas City next Monday night. Yeah, if you're looking for nonstop coverage of the Monday night Ravens Chiefs game, uh, you definitely want to listen to Inside Access on 105.7 The Fan in Baltimore or anywhere on the Radio.com app. We are on from two to six Eastern. Uh, pretty much. I mean, we talk a little bit of those, but it, yeah, Tony, you're right. With this huge game and, and yeah, the Ravens zero and two against the Chiefs, and that being their bugaboo, and John Harbaugh being an Andy Reid disciple, and Mahomes and Lamar, and yeah, there's there's a lot to cover in this game, and uh, you know, we'll have a lot of guests, we'll have a lot of uh, analysis, and some stupid yuck yuck fun too, Tony. So thank you. For the opportunity, you could find me there from 2 to 6 every weekday. And I look forward to our next chat, buddy. Thank you, Jason. Jason Lock and Floral Boys and Girls. Enjoy he's, the game. He, Thank you. Yeah, He's great. I mean, he's just simply, he's simply great. Um, we will take a break. Gary Braun will say hi to us when we come back. Uh, not hi to us in person, but hi to us over the phone when we come back. I'm Tony Kornheiser. You're listening to The Tony Kornheiser Show. This is the Indochino ad. <coughs> Excuse me for coughing. Let me drink some water. They want me to personalize ideas. They want me to talk. You know, it's stupid to ask me to do this. Nigel has bought three of these suits. Take it away. Yes, you drink some water. I will tell the fine listening audience about Indochino. They're fantastic suits. I first got one at a wedding I was in. Um, I measured myself famously with a yardstick and a piece of rope. Fit yeah, me like good. love. You could probably go to a tailor and get it done. But once you get it, you can design the suit any way you want. The cuffs, the lapels, you want monograms, however you want it. It gets to you in a ridiculously short amount of time. And it's unbelievably um, fairly priced. I mean, it really is a great deal for you. And you've loved it. And you've bought, you bought a total of three suits. Three, because I look great in them. I mean, every time I go out, people are like, man, Nigel, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm wearing Indochino. That's what I do. With Indochino, you get custom-fitted suits, coats, and casual wear at surprisingly affordable prices. Customize everything, as Nigel told you, from the fabric and the lining to the lapel shape, the monogram. And since your order is made to your exact measurements, it always fits you perfectly. If you're getting married, Indochino is a no-brainer for you and your groomsmen. Forget off-the-rack suits that don't fit different body types. Indochino gives everyone a tailored fit. Order with ease, get it shipped fast, no matter where you live. And with all the ways to customize, you can add a personal touch. Everyone will be proud to wear without emptying their pockets. The best part, Indochino suits start at just $299 with all these customizations included. 
Visit one of the Indochino showrooms across North America or book a virtual appointment and shop online at Indochino.com. And right now, you will get $30 off any purchase of $399 or more when you enter the code TONYK at checkout. That's Indochino, I-N-D-O-C-H-I-N-O, Indochino.com, promo code Tony K. And what do we say? Use the code, oh. people. You're listening to The Tony Kornheiser Show. The Tony Kornheiser Show. This is a song called Love Again. Um, is this by Dejari? Is that how that's pronounced, Nigel? Dejari? Well, it's featuring it. The song is by Dana DeVore featuring uh, Dizani, I believe, or Dizari. Dizani? Okay. But Deanna DeVore is the or person Dizari. who does the song. Dejari. Yes. All right. It's called Love Again. We get people, they have interesting names, like Rose from Texas well, they're and Dejari. Artists. Yeah, I understand. And Whistler's mother was an artist too, but she was just Whistler's mother. You know what I mean? <laughs> Michael, if people wanna, if people like Deanna wanna send us their beautiful, beautiful music, which can be heard in its entirety at the end of this podcast, how do they do it? Send us your music by emailing it to jingles at tonyquinnazershow dot com. We try not to plug ourselves and That's sell my stuff. Voice. Yeah, but is, are we selling anything at the moment? Yes, go to shop dot dot com where we have some hats and sweatshirts available. And so it's we're getting into sweatshirt oh, weather. Oh yeah, right. say hi to Rob. Uh, yes, Rob Colpian. Um, so Gary Braun joins us. We haven't talked to Gary on the air in a while, though Michael and Gary have gone back and forth about golf clubs. So I hope that's worked out well. Um, so with sports back, I mean, I really miss, I've got to be honest, I really miss the way we used to do the show when we all sat together. We can't do that at the moment, and I, and I understand that. But at least with sports back, we're not just talking about the virus and protests every single day. We can lose ourselves in sports. You're a sports fan. Are you, how are you dealing with and are you satisfied by the sports that you're watching? Um, hi, Tony, Michael, Nigel. Um, I, I don't know, Tony. I mean, honestly, it's, I, I'm, I am, it's, I've been changed a little bit as a sports fan, I think, I mean, I think as, as we've all been, been changed in some way or another by this. So, um, I, I have not, um, so let me, let me start at the, start at the top for me because football is, is kind of the, the mountaintop yeah. for me. Yeah. Um, and, and of course college football has been, been disappointing to, to say the least, but the NFL for me has like felt, pretty good now I, I was pretty desperate by the time that came around because baseball just hasn't worked i mean part of that is is the nats sitch but it uh, part of that is how the stadiums look and feel empty is just weird um the weirdest part of that the weirdest part of that is they still light up the scoreboards and they still play the music and they still have an announcer and you sit there on television and go, there's nobody there. Why are you doing this? It's insane. It's just insane it it, to me. It doesn't feel right. But I, no. it, look, perspective is everything. If I had told you in February when pitchers and catchers report that the Nats weren't going to lose 40, you'd be ecstatic, right? <laughs> yeah, but, yes, that. That's right. Um, right. That's right. So, I, you know, I've, I had, I've had a hard time coming. But basketball took me, I know this will upset Wilbon, but it took me a long time to, like, warm up to basketball. It just wasn't feeling right and i don't you know i'm not i've sat on the couch for you enough to, on these covid appearances but i mean i've just chalked it up to um this thing and i say this thing very broadly i don't mean covid i mean everything sort of it encompasses um has has changed me i guess and that's probably uh just to be very candid uh, the extent to which I want to get into it on the air with you, <laughs> we can talk about it some other time. Um, so the, the short answer to your question is um, sports have been a nice distraction, but uh, they j I don't find them as important to me as they were a year ago, to be honest. Do you, I mean, is there one sport in which, is it baseball, is it football, where you say, where you look at it and you go, there are no fans, and this affects me more negatively than the other sports. So for me, that's been baseball. I mean, I've heard you talking about this with other with other people, and I've heard your thoughts on it. For for me, that's been baseball. 
to me, basketball, for how different it is, I mean, how different it would actually look if you were in the arena, I think they've done a pretty good job mm-hmm. making mm-hmm. that look and feel normal on television. I mean, it feels like it feels like there are people there, and it feels like there is some depth to it. Um, the football thing is so weird with the piped-in noise, and, and I've read mm-hmm. that um, at least I think with Fox, they, the noise they're piping in is specific to that stadium. So when they're at, uh, you know, whatever, whatever stadium they're at, they're using actual noise that they've grabbed from games at that stadium. But it's just, it's, it's wrong to me. Like sometimes it just doesn't, the noises don't jive with the action. Now that said, if it was, if there was no crowd noise, I'm sure it would look and feel very weird. Um, but I, I can't help. I, I can't help but feel like when I watch it that like is 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 everything now not just fake? You know, it's like can't we just? I, I kind of just want to like watch them for what they are, and I feel like whoever's producing these things, and I I understand. I mean, I I get it. I get that it works for ratings, but there's just a part of me that's just like, man, do I have to? Do I have to be manipulated? Do I have to be? gaslit and everything that I see and do and watch. It's like, just let me watch some football. Let me watch some baseball. Let me watch some basketball. But yeah. um, to, to answer your question, baseball for me is just, I, I just, I couldn't get there. It's just anytime I saw anything wide, I just felt like it was practice or spring training. And, and, and of course the, the, the season and the, the notion of how their season was going to work, air quotes work at, at 60, whatever games, it was just, that was a bridge too far for me. Yeah, I, I'm. Um, I, I like watching the red zone now because I don't see the crowd as much, and because they go from game to game, I have difficulty watching a specific game because of what you are saying. I, I do though. I fell in. I talked about this in the open today. I did fall back into baseball even without the crowds because I can, through all these years of watching baseball, I can isolate on what the baseball game is and what the strategies are and what is going around. But I don't, um, there's a certain, there is for me too, a certain emptiness in it. I want, I want to be more passionate about it than I am. And not just angry all the time as I am with the Nats bullpen all the time, or people yeah, like that, Eric Thames who belong on the team. So that, that's well articulated. That, that's, that's largely how I feel now. Baseball uh, you know, baseball has been your staple. That's been your appointment yes, viewing for a whole time. Life. I mean, I'm not surprised yep. to hear that. So we're all going to, I would think, gravitate towards that. And thing yours is football. Has been the thing. Yeah, yeah, it has been. Um, it Are has you been. watching? I, like you have been. Yeah, I mean, I, and I, I think I'm going to answer your question. I mean, I've been doing a lot of the red zone too. I have not been like laser focused on the football team. Um, and I don't, you know, again, I just feel, um, <laughs> not, to, not to get all weepy on you, but I just feel like that's something else that's, that's sort of broken for me. So, um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a fantasy player, obviously. Spike and Ike, by the way, are both in the Littles Fantasy League. Good. Which, which, um, which I am not. So they're big fantasy players. So there's a lot of red zone action. There's a lot of flipping around and the Redskins just aren't, or I'm sorry, the football team. I um, slip all the time. I slip yeah, half uh, the time. And I think I we will for a couple of years. Yeah. yeah they, they just don't, they don't, they don't move the needle for me. I mean, it's just, they're not that relevant in this house anymore. Yeah. I mean, I'm, if I didn't have the red zone, I think I'd be upset at watching games because of the lack of fans it's even the same i mean golf works without fans it golf yeah. works but yeah. boy oh boy at a major the way DeShambo played the the ambient noise the crowd there that would have been a big deal that could maybe flip who wins and who doesn't in a very close tournament and and uh, it's noticeable i'm glad sports are on the air i'm glad i have something to talk about because i make a living doing it but it is not it is not completely satisfying i'm not like you i i'm not always noticing the distance but i notice it often i do well the the golf thing to me is interesting because the the golf I think for me, watching golf has felt the le- the least different of of anything me too. because or horse racing. You can just 
Yeah. Because it's just so it's just so action based. It's so not reliant on any of the other stuff. But that said, I think you're right. Like a, a crowd at a golf tournament, especially on a Sunday, or especially like this this past Sunday, makes a difference. Yes. I mean, could could really make a difference more. Well, I mean, I guess you know, you get home fields in all these sports. I mean, it affects the officiating in all these sports. I mean, everything is, yeah, everything's just different. Well, the last different. time we had a New York City general area major was when Kepka was fueled up by all the fans cheering loudly for DJ at Beth Page, and he heard that on the back nine. Yeah, I, I mean, I do. I think it matters. You had yeah. a situation where the two leaders both eagled the same hole. I mean, that would have been monstrous. I mean, people would have screamed and screamed. You right. know, when you, you don't that. have that. Yeah. All right, let me get hey, to your Tony, kids. I, I, How, I, go ahead. Can I, can I, I'm sorry, I don't want to upend your exhaustive preparation for this, yeah. this very important interview. But, mm. um, but while we're on sports, I have a question for you about something you touched on. I think it was last week or Monday. But as we look for things to do around the house with the boys, you, you, you kind of planted a little Easter egg and then moved on for it. I had so many questions. Steal the bacon. Can we do it? Yeah, yeah. Dive and to steal the bacon. What What mm -hmm. are the rules? How is that game okay. played? What What is the What is the modern day equivalent? Okay, so I don't know the modern day equivalent. I can tell you that I first in, encountered this game when I was at camp over sixty years ago, probably sixty five years ago, and we used to have a thing once a week at Camp Kiuma called novelty relays, and the entire camp would gather. And they would gather in a large uh, rec hall, recreational hall, and games would have to be devised so that all people from five years old to 16 years old could play these games. And the way Steal the Bacon works is five or six or seven people line up on opposite sides of the floor, much like in dodgeball. That's what the lineup looks like. It is, okay. um, it is horizontal, not vertical. That's the lineup. And then each person is assigned a number, and a number is called, and in the middle of the floor, in a circle, uh, where you would have the tip of a basketball game, um, a bowling pin or something resembling a bowling pin is placed. That's what it looks like, a bowling pin. When the number is called, the two of you who have these numbers on opposing teams run to that area and try to steal the pin or steal the bacon. In order to get a point, you have to run back to your sideline before you are touched by the other person. So there's a certain amount of strategy as you move around and move around. Do you faint? Do you get the other guy to go for it? Do you think if you can make a move, do you just run out and grab it because you're faster than the other kid? I mean, if you see some loser on the other side with your number, <laughs> you just beat it back to your sideline. And that's, right, but, what, steal, that's what steal the bacon is. So I'm running at you full speed. If you go down and you decide to, to stop to bend down and pick the thing, once you've picked it up, if I touch you, yeah, I win that it. round, even though you, you the effectively point. stole the bacon. Right. That, no, you can't steal the bacon uh, and not get back to your house. You know, no, you, you grab the bacon. No, you got to steal the bacon. You got to get to your sideline. That's what you have to do. Now, I don't know how many people okay. know what that is. Maybe it's just Camp Kiyuma for all I know, but that was, no, that was like what that. it is. Okay, thank you. You can I, play I, it I, at I, home. I mean, it, it's, you know, the show to me sounds very much like it has always sounded, especially now with sports back. But, but for me in particular, and I'm sure this applies to the, the, uh, the Davids and Jeans and Tori and the, the, the CNN guy, his name escapes me, but it's hard for me. It, it's different for me to listen because I'm used to being able to react and follow you're on it and have questions. Because you're on and it all the time. Right. Yeah. yeah. And you went there and I was like, wait a minute, I, I need to know about steal the bacon. So I'm, yeah. I'm sorry yeah. to curtail things. We need to get a vaccine and go back and do the show. How are the boys? Uh, the boys are, are doing fine. Uh, Michael, thank you for your help with, with Spike's golf clubs. Um, I'm getting to the stage in, in Spike's golf game where, like, I wonder if the next time I beat him will be the last. Do you remember that, Tony? Yeah, Michael was about 11 or 12. We have that the scorecard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Was, uh, Framed. Yeah, yeah. Just, well, yeah. I was going to say, your, your kid was younger than I, and you were shooting lower than me. But, yeah, he's, uh, he finally yeah. got his first set of, of uh, big boy clubs. So... Um, but no, they're, they're fine. They're back to school. I mean, where we are, obviously school is still remote all the time and it's way less, way fewer hours, I should say, than it would normally be. And, 
and Wednesdays, in fact, are sort of like a swing day, which I think the uh, I think the more common term for it is Saturday. And so it's it's four days. It's basically four days a week, like four to five hours a day, and it's it's um, it's a cause of of some consternation around here because I do, they're they're plenty dumb. I don't need them getting dumber, and I'm trying to get them to do more and do work. But this thing is um, it, it's beyond the point where it's a blip. You know, I mean, it's now significantly affecting the education of everyone who's, who's trying to be educated at this time, but, um, but they're no worse for the wear. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're far more resilient than I. And Sydney in Michigan. Um, Sydney is still at Michigan uh, and is, uh, has never been happier. She's, she's doing great up there. Thank you for asking that. I must say Michigan, I am learning now. I, I get that all, I mean, you're on a college campus. It's it's going to be a liberal place, but man, this Ann Arbor, man, it makes it makes Bernie Sanders look like Orrin Hutch. I mean, it's <laughs> crazy the the extent of so she, Michigan in the month that she has been there has had a uh, an, a resident advisors strike, which went a couple weeks long. That just ended earlier this week. Um, that started with, with there are two RAs on her floor. You know what resident advisors are, yep. obviously, right? Yep. These are the, the, you know, the, the student, typically the upperclassmen student who live on the floor and, and kind of police the floor. So about a week into school, one of her, the RAs were already bucking a little bit. And one of hers just said, forget this. I'm out. I don't feel safe. I'm not doing this. When the, uh, when the strike started, the other one, check this out, sent a text to all the kids on the floor uh, essentially saying, look, I, I have one rule. If someone tells you to be quiet, be quiet. You know, I'm not interested in busting you for what you're doing in your room, but just kind of respect each other. Oh, and by the way, I'm almost never here. So kind of you're on your own. <laughs> and, oh, and, if you, and if you let anyone, and if you, if you let anyone know, I sent you this text. Yes. This text in writing, I'll kill you. Is basically yeah, how he ended. Uh, so um, you know, so so they were kind of on their own, and then the um, and then the graduate, uh, what they call the GSIs, the graduate student instructors, sort of like the teacher assistants. Who, um, if you're in a very large class, Sydney is, has got 15 class hours. Three of them are actually in person, where um, a class of a group of maybe 15 kids would go discuss the topic with their graduate student instructor in a large, like a 100-person lecture hall, like very socially distanced and all of that. Um, but the GSIs went on strike uh, right after Labor Day, and that one lasted about a week and a half. And they were asking for some very reasonable things like more COVID testing and better uh you know, better safety and support from the administration in that regard. But they were also asking for things that, that I didn't, understand necessarily how they were connected to graduate student instruction things like a complete defunding of the department of safety and security <laughs> which seemed like a little bit of an overreach to me uh, yeah, uh, yeah yeah so so uh you know my uh. kid is getting uh I, I sent her there to get an education and, and she's getting it in 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 many forms um and i guess sort of the the concerning breaking news is is literally 30 minutes before you guys called. I got a note from her that there's been a uh, a, a case of COVID, and there've been obviously, you know, there's going to be cases. Of course, uh, but, but her of pat- course. her particular quad is now considered a, a cluster. There's been a, a significant handful of cases, and there's one now on her floor, just just two doors down and, and across the hall from a couple of guys who um, she knows. But but college kids are. Uh, they're like people in that they're all different. So some of the kids, I mean, my, my kid is, um, is a pretty cautious kid who wants to be there and seems to understand the stakes. So is going to need to do what she needs to do, even if it means backing off the social scene a little bit. And, and some kids of course are, are more like my kid's father and they're just, there going crazy <laughs> doing whatever they want to do and partying all the time and not wearing masks. Mm. And, um, so, yeah, I mean, this is what I'm sure, you know, as you read about, which is what we're dealing with in universities all over the country. So, um, you know, crossing fingers for the fall, um, not expecting to uh, get back in the studio with you like in November or anything like that, given no, the uh, no, given the no. state of things, but hoping I can soon enough. 
Wonderful. We it's a pleasure to talk to you. Best to Kim. Likewise. I'm Best glad to you guys Kim. are well. I will. Thank Gary you, Braun. Gary Braun, boys and girls. It's a total pleasure. We'll take a break. We'll come back with email and jingle. I'm Tony Kornheiser. This is the Tony Kornheiser Show. This is the Harry's ad. Harry's just came out with their sharpest blades ever. And unlike some other razor companies, they're not charging you more for their new product improvement. Harry's new sharper blades are still as low as $2 each. Other razor companies have increased their prices when they introduce something new. Harry's is delivering their sharpest blades ever, and they're not raising prices. They're so sharp, these new blades, that in a study with guys shaving four times a week, the guys reported that with Harry's new blades, their eighth shave was as smooth as their first. How do they do that? Well, they own a German factory that's been honing razor blades for 100 years. They source their steel from Sweden, doesn't everybody, and own the entire manufacturing process from R&D to the factory floor. This allows them to keep prices low, and they confidently stand by a 100% quality guarantee on harrys.com. Give Harry's sharpest blades ever a try. Harry's has an amazing offer for listeners of this high-quality podcast. New U.S. customers, and I'm assuming that's most of us, new U.S. customers can redeem a Harry's trial set at harrys.com slash Tony K. You'll get a five-blade razor featuring their new sharper blade, a weighted handle foaming shave gel with aloe, and a travel cover to protect your blade when you're on the go. Just go to harrys, H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com slash Tony K and redeem your trial offer today. Use the code, people. This is free. Use the code. You're listening to The Tony Kornheiser Show. Here comes Tony's mailbag. Got your email factors and your notes. Here comes Tony's mailbag. Gonna read some for all you folks. That was in honor of Gary's appearance on the show. So great to hear him. Nigel, you want to do the Bethesda bagel ad? Oh, yes, thank you. We love Bethesda bagels. You will as well. Lots of locations around the D.C. area. Just go to BethesdaBagels.com for the location nearest you. We go to the one in Bethesda Row, 4819 Bethesda Avenue. Um, they're open every day or from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Stop on by. You will find something you love because we love them. We know you will, too. If I were doing the bagel read, I would have teased their Yum Kippur menu to help you break fast. <laughs> yum, not yum. 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 The yum break Kippur. fast. Yes. Well said. That'll just about do us do it for us today. But before we get to the mailbag, let me just say Virgil Kane is the name, and I served on the Danville train till Stoneman's Cavalry came and tore up the tracks again. In the winter of 65, we were hungry, just barely alive. By May the 10th, Richmond had fell. It's a time I remember oh so well, the night they drove old Dixie down. It's the best song the band ever did. It's one of the great so songs good. of all time. Great songs of all time. Thanks to our guests today, Jason Lock and Fora, Gary Braun. Thanks to our sponsors today, Lincoln Financial, Indochino, and Harry's Razors. Remember, you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Radio.com. If you got the show through iTunes, please leave us a review. From Ron Walker in Westerville, Ohio. Walker? Didn't Walker. Didn't <laughs> Tasty Fishkins open for Blossom End Rot on their farewell tour? That is brilliant. Just a brilliant email. Love that email. Uh, from Kevin Koval or Koval. In Northville, Michigan, dear Dr. Bootsy and the Hammer 72-year-old grandpa, as a loyal little who got his affinity for the show while living in Shanghai, China for three years, your recent package at the club brought back memories of one of my favorite pastimes while there. My favorite lunch spot near my office was a little hole in the wall that served the best sautéed vegetable platter topped with salted egg. It was easily one of my favorite regular meals, especially as I would pop in my headphones on the walk just to listen to the podcast. Just be glad that your package didn't come with the eyes and brains mixed in. Trust me, it's a little bit different. From Jason Blazer, and I keep getting this wrong, it's either Lake Orion, Michigan, or Lake Orion, Michigan, quoting me, I've eaten a piece of the salted egg fish skins. I don't particularly like them. Well, there goes my plans for the weekend. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Information for life. From Josh Cromwell, he's been with us forever, from Moselle, Mississippi. I think we now know what the last place prize for next year's bracket contest will be. Fish skins are no Chinese mystery meat, but they will certainly suffice. From David Feinson, um, I'm eagerly writing from the heart of the Willamette Dammit Valley to inform you Nigel has failed once again. The John Dory is absolutely a fish. This is what I said. It's common in UK waters and elsewhere in the eastern parts of the Atlantic Ocean. If one was to, to describe the feature, the creature, a face for radio would certainly suffice. I also want to thank you for your kind words on the staggering devastation Oregon is experiencing from wildfires. Oregonians are tough and adaptable people, but our citizens deserve attention and aid. 
Harvest workers and winemakers are working in especially difficult conditions to produce some of the nation's best wine. You've spoken highly in the past about our state's finest export, and I ask that you urge listeners to again support Oregon winemakers if at all possible. Many of our smaller producers sell wine at retail pricing on their website. Some of my favorite Oregon wineries include Cameron, Swick, Day Wines, Holden, Maloof, etc. And that's really nice. Now, we are partial to the Willamette Valley Winery and to Bells Up because of Duska Jensen and, and Mr. Spector. But, you know, you know, buy their wine. Uh, Jim Garland, Columbus, Ohio. My daughter's, my co-worker's six-year-old daughter asked an interesting question that I feel must be answered by a literature major slash journalist like yourself, especially one who has an, uh, a doctorate of humane letters and a famous Hofwaff member. We all know the famous nursery rhyme, Bingo. As the rhyme stated, there was a farmer who had a dog and Bingo was his name-o. Growing up, we always assumed that the dog was named Bingo. However, because of the comma in the middle of the rhyme, wouldn't the farmer's name be Bingo instead? My coworker and I are in a pointless debate. My coworker still says the dog is Bingo. Now I am leaning to the farmer. My argument is if we change out the dog to say a pen, then the logic would make the farmer's name Bingo. Because who would name their pen, especially a name of Bingo? Can you please give us an official solution to this hour-long debate? Michael? Bingo's the dog. Okay, that's it. Uh, from Charles A. Jenkins. I, got the, I have the rhyme now stuck in my head. Yeah. Um, yeah. CJ from the land of Wilbon. Say, old sport, was the game Capture the Bacon created before mirth or fun? Sure sounds like it. I just explained all of it. Uh, sounds like a football Jay drill. Grant McGuire. Love your body analytics for Zion and Bryson. I'm 64. If I send you my photo, can you tell me how many good walking years I have left? I'm talking about walking at my elite two miles an hour level. How long is this sustainable? You have me worried. I only have four or five years left. From Thomas Atkinson, also in Lake Orion or Orion, Michigan. We have a cluster there. The woman to whom I'm related by marriage made me watch the Hallmark movie Love on the Sidelines featuring Joe Theismann. And God, it was bad. All of these Hallmark movies are the same, but at least they change with the seasons. I'm sure Carol is quite excited for the Thanksgiving and Christmas, Christmas ones. Carol gave it soon. a thumbs up. Watch out for the upcoming Quarantined at the Christmas Gazebo coming Ooh. to a Hallmark movie channel near you. And for information for life from Greg Thomas in Cincinnati, Ohio. I, and we're going to get to mushrooms. We have a lot of mushroom ones. We'll get to them on Friday. I was intrigued with the email about Cy Young's hometown being Peoli. He actually was born in Gilmore, Ohio, lived on a far farm he bought near Peoli. But after his wife died, he moved into a home in New Newscomerstown, Ohio, where he spent the rest yeah. of his life. Now, here is something that you may like since you enjoy stories of small worlds. After retirement, Cy coached the local hometown baseball team. His bat boy, who also did chores for Cy, was another local boy who would go on to some fame, one Wayne Woodrow Hayes, Woody as he is better known. And of course, you know, he went on to be the coach at the Ohio State University. Small world indeed. Tell Michael to donate the socks to a homeless shelter. If you're out on your bike tonight, everyone, as always, do wear white. Later, he gets the rebound, passes it to the man, shoots it, and boom, and goes the dynamite. Boom goes dynamite. Lexus bass hit like a drop key Every day like spring break Got a whippy going topless I'm about that action Baby, f*** that talking She gon' give it up Like they pay me when I walk right in Right now, right now Tell me that you need me right now Right now Got so much to do Right now, right now Tell me that you need me right now
what's the for you? You've been chasing me while I've been out chasing Ferrari. All I know is me and all my know is party. All you want is me with you gazing with nice and slow. Right now, right now, tell me that you need me right now, right now. Got so much to do right now, right now. Tell me that you need me right now, right now. Got so much to do right now, right now. Tell me that you need me right now, right now. Got so much to do right now, right now. Tell me that you need me right now, right now. Got so much. Between 